Welcome to our screencast on trends in chordate evolution. You might be wondering, what's a chordate? Well, before I tell you what a chordate is, let me tell you what a chordate isn't. Bugs are not chordates, worms are not chordates, and sponges aren't chordates either. The remaining animals you see, along with about 75,000 other species, do belong to the phylum we know as chordata, or chordates. All chordates must have the four following characteristics. The first is something that we call a notochord. A notochord is a structural um, support that's made of stiffened tissue, and it can um, obviously provide structure for the organism, and it also can help protect the second characteristic, which is the nerve cord. The nerve cord is a centralized um, system of nerves, or bundle of nerves, that runs along the notochord. The next um, characteristic, the third characteristic, is pharyngeal slits. Now, all chordates at some point in their development have pharyngeal slits. However, as different organisms develop, the pharyngeal slits can develop into different structures. So, uh, for example, in some organisms it will develop into gills, and others it will develop into an organ known as the pharynx. The pharynx is uh, located right behind your mouth, but before your esophagus. And it's used for eating and breathing in all chordates. Um, and the last characteristic is also something that just needs to occur at some point in their development, and that is a tail, or an extension beyond the notochord. So yeah, at one point in your development, you did have a tail. Now we're going to get into some of the derived characteristics of chordates. So not all chordates have a cranium, but most do, and probably all of the ones you've heard of do. A cranium is something that's going to protect the um, sensitive organs in the head. So why would a chordate want to have a cranium? Well, if you have a um, bundle of nerves located near the head or any sensitive organs such as eyes, um, you're going to want to protect those. The next derived characteristic of chordates that we're going to look at are jaws. So there are some chordates, such as um, this animal here on the left, a lamprey, that do not have jaws. Lamprey um, just kind of suction on to their prey, um, but they can't chew, uh, they don't have that capability. So once jaws developed, that allowed chordates to bite, to grasp, um, and to be able to eat a little bit more efficiently. Um, the early chordates, such as the lamprey, didn't have a true skeleton. So a skeleton is something that evolved a little bit later, and um, there are two types. So most things um, in the chordate family are going to have a bony skeleton. However, some groups, like sharks, have cartilage skeletons, and they work very much in the same way. The structure of them is just a little bit different. So how did we get from animals that lived in the water, fish and sharks, to tetrapods, or animals that have four limbs? Um, I have a picture of a tetris piece here. Uh, tetrapods are not walking tetris pieces. However, I think it helps to um, give you an idea of why they're called tetrapods, if you look at this little tetris piece. So you can see tetris pieces are made of one, two, three, four little blocks, and tetrapods are animals with four limbs. Uh, the earliest tetrapods were actually fish. Um, we believe that they may have looked something like this. Uh, this is Tiktaalik, which was, fa this fossil was found by Dr. Neil Shubin, who came to visit us at the STEM Academy last year. And, um, he hypothesized that this is kind of the connection between fish that lived in water and early amphibians which lived on land. So there's the fishapod as we call him. 
So after we moved on onto land, after tetrapods, we're able to um, develop that leg structure to be able to walk around on land. Um, the advantage for them initially was that there wasn't a lot going on on land. So there wasn't much competition for food or space, um, and it was pretty safe. However, there were some disadvantages to being a tetrapod. One is that, the biggest one, is that water was still necessary for them. They needed to live near water because they needed to um, lay their eggs in water. So if you think of frogs, uh, frogs have to go back to water to lay their eggs, and then the tadpoles need to survive in the water for a little bit of time until they develop um, a little bit more, and then they're able to come out on land. However, they're still tied to the water because they must always go back there to lay their eggs. Tetrapods, um, early tetrapods, also were tied to water because they needed to maintain a moist breathing surface, um, which would be lungs, to be able to get oxygen into the blood. So they no longer needed gills, they were able to breathe outside of water, but they still needed to keep that moist. Um, so the solution to the problem with having to lay eggs in water is the development of this next characteristic, the amniotic egg. An amniotic egg allows an organism to lay eggs on land and not in water. And that structure here in this picture, the amnion, is in green. And um, that structure surrounds the embryo and prevents it from drying out. So lots of different animals lay eggs, but there is a difference between fish eggs, amphibian eggs, and these late, this later characteristic, amniotic eggs. So an amniotic egg is um, an egg of an animal that lays eggs on land. However, some um, chordates evolved to keep that amniotic egg inside and then give live birth. So both egg-laying animals on land and animals that give live birth both have the characteristic of amniotic egg. The next characteristic that we're going to look at are um, coverings. So scales, feathers, and fur, as you can see in these three pictures, um, when you look at them up close, they do look very different. However, an interesting thing here is that they're all made of the same thing. They're all made of keratin. Um, these scales, we're going to call them dry scales, are different than the scales of fish. So scales, feathers, and hair are all closely related structures. They're all derived from, our feathers and hair are derived from dry scales. So the ancestors of animals that have feathers or hair had dry scales. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the screencast. Um, before you go ahead on to the next part of this activity, make sure that you took detailed notes while you were watching um, because you won't be able to come back and watch this again. Make sure that you re-listen to any parts that were confusing to you and ask your teacher if you have any questions.